1 Samuel uh, chapter 3 tonight. Um, this, uh, the title of the message tonight is, When You Don't Hear From God. You know, when I was in college, um, I, I kind of went overboard with, um, with knowledge. You know, I, 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 I just studied everything that I could. Um, and a lot of the, a lot of the uh, knowledge I, I really committed to memory, where I was able to just know where something was. Like my professor would reference something, I'd know exactly where in the book where it was. I, I was, I mean, I, I really, and I'm not saying this to brag, I'm, my, my point being, I was really filling my head with knowledge. All that I could possibly learn. This was totally new to me. Because when I was in high school, I, I was um, actually homeschooled. And uh, that was, that translates to, for those of you who have tried homeschooling your kids, that basically equated to maybe one year's of school and the other years I just kind of skipped. <laughs> but, and, you know, I passed. Um, <laughs> anyways, obviously when I tried to go to college, I had to take quite a few courses to get me back up where I should have been. <laughs> anyways, um, when, as, I, as I kept learning, I kept learning, I kept learning, eventually I hit a wall. You know, um, I know everything that there is to know. And, you know, God can't teach me anything. And, you know, I don't want to be, ever be in ministry because all those people are too stupid. And, you know, I'm just smarter than them. I'm smarter than all the pastors. I'm, I'm smarter than everybody in the whole world. You know, you take all their... You, you guys have been young before, right? Young and stupid, you remember. Uh, you, when you think that you know everything, you know, I, my parents, I don't have to listen to them because they're just idiots. And then you get to be about, well, I'm, I'm 27 and I already recognize it. So however old you guys were when you re realized it, like, oh, man, maybe my parents weren't as dumb as I thought they were. And uh, then it all starts heading downhill. Then you start having kids and then they know more than you. And, oh, man, it just repeats itself over again. And you try to stop the train wreck somewhere, you know, like, hey, hold on. I said that same thing, and I'm the parent that I always wish my parents were. You're supposed to love me and listen to me. You know, and then, no, well, Dad, you're wrong. You know, I, I know everything. It's like, crap, dang it, what did I do wrong in, in, the, in the equation here? How can I have broken the cycle? And then, you know, your kids go off, and, you know, they think they know everything, and then they repeat the same thing. And it's like the never-ending cycle of, I, I know more than you. So, uh, for those of you who are older in the room, you'll know what I'm talking about. For those of you who are younger in the room, you will know what I'm talking about. Um... <laughs> Yeah, anyways, my moral of the story being that I hit this wall. You know, this this kind of just book. I stopped learning, I stopped growing spiritually and mentally. So I wasn't getting any closer to God, and I wasn't getting any more, more knowledge. And I kind of want to use that as a launching point for what we're going to be talking about tonight. Ask yourself a few very small questions that have a lot, a lot of impact. The first... When is the last time you heard from God? I'm not talking about you went to a service where a message was given. I mean where you were seeking after God and you knew, without a doubt, God is speaking to me. And you knew exactly what he, what, he, what he was saying. You know what I mean? If you don't know what I'm talking about, that, that should concern you. And that leads me to my second question. When is the last time you had a victory? So sometimes we just kind of go through life and we just kind of cruise through things. When is the last time you had a victory? Because victories don't happen on accident. Uh, if, you've, if you suffer with depression or anxiety, you know that you don't just one day wake up and go, yeah, I'm over it. I mean, it's something that you wake up with and you have to intentionally fight it. It's something that you have to be very intentional with that battle. And it's the exact same thing with, say, for instance, gossip. You don't just one day wake up and stop talking about people. You have to consciously work towards winning a single battle. And that battle takes all of your strength. And then you keep going and keep going. And you get better and better. But you keep going and you fall, and you keep going and you fall. <coughs> See what I mean? And uh, so the first question, when is the last time you heard from God? The second one, when is the last time you had a victory? And that is directly related with this last question. When is the last time you left your comfort and got more involved in ministry? When is the last time you gave up what was better for you for what was better for someone else? When was the last time you said, I don't like public speaking, but I'm going to do it anyways for the sake of winning even one to, one to Christ? When was the last time you said, this is going to be hard for me to do, but I'm going to do it anyways because my life is not all about me? See, sometimes we don't have victory in our life because we aren't willing to give up ourselves in our lives. You understand what I'm saying? Why did I stop growing? Because my life was all about me. 
how did I get past that block? I'm a associate pastor now. You know what my greatest fear in life is? Past tarantulas. Oh my goodness. <laughs> tarantulas. Past heights. Okay, let me tell you something about heights. You guys know those, those, those like, I don't even know, the, the really tall extender ladders. How, how tall do they go, like 18th or something? They go quite a bit. This was me framing a house, okay? This is the first rung, okay? I would step up on that first rung like this and try and just hold up the piece of plywood with my foot trying to stay on the ground. And I remember my brother Tim would say, now, you know, if you get maybe another step up on the ladder, you might not fall over. You just... So past my fear of heights is being a pastor. Why? This is exactly verbatim the prayer that I prayed to God. God, please never, ever, ever make me a senior pastor because I don't like people and I don't want to have to deal with their problems and I just want them to do what they're supposed to do and to leave me alone. And please don't ever make me a senior pastor. To this day, God has never called me to be a senior pastor, so I got out lucky so far. But I'm 27 and I'm already weighing things might not go according to my plan in the future. Joe is over 80, and he's not dead yet, okay? So I'm 27. There's a lot of ground between 27 and 80, guys. Things could go downhill somewhere in the future. But anyway, anyways, um, <laughs> so when is the last time you left that place of comfort? Chris Sarkson, a, a, leader, a leadership uh, trainer that we've been, um, I guess you could say, studying under, if you want to put it like that. One thing he says is, you will either find yourself in a place of continual comfort or continual challenge. And this doesn't, isn't just for leaders, this is for everyone. You will either find yourself doing what's comfortable and easy or rising above, challenging and conquering. I mean, you kids, it'll be easy for you guys to not pay attention to school, to not go to college and to just stay, in, and stay doing what you're doing, but you won't ever achieve anything with your lives. You who are older, it's easy for you to just slack off. Hey, I'm older now. I don't have to, I don't have to press on anymore. I've, I've, I've passed over the hill. I can just take it easy from now on. That's easy to do. But, the, but it's tied, directly tied with hearing from God and having victory. If you want to hear from God and you want to have victory, you have to give up the comfortable things in life for the better things in life. And that's always how it is. 1 Samuel chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Now the boy, uh, boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli, and word from the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were infrequent. So Samuel is this young man who has been dedicated to service in the temple. What that means is that when he was born, when he was done drinking milk and he was on regular food, so around like maybe three or four, his mom took him to the temple and just kind of dropped him off, transferred ownership from her to them, and he spent his entire life serving in the temple. That's what that means. Now, Eli, who's the second person mentioned in verse 1, he is the priest, the, the, the head honcho over the temple. Okay? So now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli, and word from the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were infrequent. So that brings us to hopefully the question that all of us ask at this point. Why? Why was, were, were words from the Lord infrequent? Why was nobody having visions? That should be one of the first questions. Why is this the thing? And if we look back in the book, it actually tells us in the previous chapter, chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. And it goes on saying, uh, the custom of the priests, and, and the, so they were doing all this stuff that was against the law, they were despising God, and it, did, and it goes through all this thing. And then verse 17 just gives a summary of, what, of all this stuff, other stuff. Thus the son of the young man was very great before the Lord, for the men despised the offering of the Lord. They despised it. How did they despise it? By not honoring God. So here we have this, the, the priests, who are supposed to be the spiritual leaders, they're just kind of dropping the ball. They're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And they're, all, they're in it for their own profit. They're in it for their own well-being. One of the things that Pastor's been talking about on Wednesday nights is, well, he stopped talking about it now, but he was talking about it for quite a few months. He was talking about false teachers. And one of the things that he talked about with false teachers is that they're in it for their own personal profit. 
And that's exactly what we see here. So their, their father, Eli, tries to get them to stop. And they don't listen, so he just kind of gives up. Then a word is given to Eli about how this is going to bring a curse from God, and he, they still, he doesn't, still doesn't actively stop it. So here we have a pattern of not honoring God. They didn't honor God, so God didn't answer them. It's that simple. Why was a was, uh, word from the Lord infrequent in, in chapter 3, verse 1? Because back in chapter 2, they weren't honoring God. They were doing whatever they wanted. They were living how, whatever way pleased them. Sometimes we live our lives for ourselves, and then we want God to do this big show of might in us and somehow open the floodgates of heaven. I don't want to seek after you. I don't want to have a prayer life. I don't want to read my Bible, but I just want God to answer every, every request that I have. I want him to just... You know, pour blessing on me. You see, you see, uh, prosperity teachers do this all the time. You know, hey, forget about trying to seek after God and obeying Him. No, no, no. you just give tithes or bless my ministry financially, and you will be financially blessed. Well, that's not true. Well, if you just pay your tithes and offering to our church, then God will make you financially rich, and your your money, your bank account will be overflowing. Well, that's not true. That that's not true. So they lie to people to get them to give them money because why? They're in it for their own profit. So then we get to the next verse. Okay, now the boy Samuel, verse one is now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli. Word from the Lord was rare in those days, visions were infrequent. So now we go to the next verse, verse two. It happened at that time, as Eli was lying down in his place, now his eyesight had begun to grow dim and he could not see well. And the lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was, that the Lord uh, called Samuel, and he said, Here I am. Then he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down again. So what we have here is we have Samuel, who is lying down to go to sleep. And he hears someone call him, so he goes to Eli, but Eli says, I didn't call you. They do this, I think it's three times that they do this. Then finally, Eli says this in verse 8. No, 7. I'm sorry, 9. And Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be if he calls you that you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Then the Lord uh, came and stood and called us at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. So here, Eli finally figures out what's going on. Ah, it's, it, he's hearing God call him. So if you do hear this, this voice calling you again, this is what you say. And he guides him to it, sends him back to bed. And Samuel does hear that voice again. And so he responds as Eli told him. So then that takes us to just a very, very important question that we just asked for chapter, for verse 1. Now we're going to ask again for verse 2. Why did God talk to Samuel? When he wasn't talking to the leaders, when he wasn't talking to all of Israel, what was the big secret here? What, how come Samuel was treated with exception? Does God not answer all of us equally? Does he have favorites? Are there some people that he just, okay, I'm going to listen to you and I'm not going to listen to you? Because that's not very fair. If I seek God, no matter how much I seek him, he won't answer me? Well, actually, if you pay attention to the story, that's not what's going on at all. First, if you look back in chapter 1... In verse 28, it says this. So I have also dedicated him to the Lord. This is, this is his mom talking. As long as he lives, he is dedicated to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Now, who is the he in the sentence? Some people have said, oh, well, it's Eli. Well, that doesn't make sense because in the whole context, he's more of an afterthought. He's the side character that's going on here. Saying enough, never once do we see Samuel praising God in the whole book of Samuel. I mean, Eli praising God in the whole book of Samuel. So... It doesn't really fit the flow. Other people said maybe it was his father, but no, it seems like his father was likely already gone at this point. So the only other male left is Samuel. So, and he worshiped there, must, by probability, be Samuel. Could it hypothetically be the dad? Yeah, it could have been. Could it have been Eli? Yeah, it could have been. But given the context, it's most likely the Samuel. So here we have Samuel, who's this little boy, like four years old. He's being left by his mom at the temple. And his response is to praise God. So now let's hop down further still, chapter 2, verse 11. 
Then Elkanah, who's the father, uh, Samuel's father, went to his home at Ramah, but the boy ministered to the Lord before Eli, the priest. What was Samuel doing while his, his dad was leaving him? Ministering to the Lord. What was he doing while his mom was leaving? Ministering to the Lord. See what he's doing? He, he's making a habit here of seeking God, not just when he's young, but as he's growing older. So then we get to uh, verse 18 again. Now Samuel was ministering before the Lord as a boy wrangled in an ephod. Now, I swear we just read that before. Let's hop down to verse 26. Now the boy Samuel was growing in stature and in favor both with the Lord and with men. Again, now we hop down to chapter 3, verse 1. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli. Again and again and again, Samuel is over here trying to get more of God. Trying to do whatever he can to serve God and to, serve and to make Eli's job easier. That's all he's doing, this whole thing. And in the middle of, of it saying, hey, Samuel's doing such a good job, is the story of Eli's sons not honoring God. Right sandwiched in between the whole affair. And then we get to chapter 3 and it says, and word from the Lord was rare. Well, why was it rare? Well, we just saw why it was rare. Because nobody was seeking after God. They were all doing whatever the heck they wanted to do. And in fact, 1 Samuel picks up right after Judges. And at the end of Judges it says... In those days there, days, there was no king. Everybody did whatever they wanted to do. That's how the book of Judges ends. And 1 Samuel is in that context. So why? Because Samuel honored God. This wasn't rocket science. Samuel honored God. God answered. It was that easy. So let's take a, few, a, a little bit to look, at, to look at a few specifics that you might have missed because I was reading kind of fast. It happened at the time, as Eli was lying down in his place, now his eyesight had begun to grow dim, and he could not see well, and the lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Where was Samuel sleeping? Next to the ark of the covenant. That wasn't even allowed. The temple had three areas, the main courtyard, that's where you would offer your sacrifices. Then it had the holy place. This was a place where they had um, an incense burner and a table and a bunch of other stuff. But then there was this third area. It was called the Holy of Holies. It was where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. It was a big no-no to go in there because God's holiness was made manifest there. If you don't know what that means, it means God's scary <laughs> in there. Okay, So just imagine this. And some people have said, well, there were these, there were these rooms that were next to, next to the holy place and on the side. And that's not what it says. It doesn't say he was sleeping near the room. It says he was sleeping where the ark was. So here he is sleeping in the holy of holies where you aren't even allowed to go. And not only is God not killing him for being somewhere that he's not allowed to go, but he's blessing him. Now, God, what is going on here? It, you know, the rules weren't meant to be broken here, God. This boy is seeking you in the wrong way. You need to wipe him out. You need to wipe him out. So what, what do we see here? We see that Eli didn't teach him that he wasn't supposed to be in there. This is the great extent of Eli's failure. He not only hasn't taken care of teaching his own children to honor God and still allowed them to serve as priests when they dishonored God, but now he has gotten a clean slate with another child. A clean slate, a chance to redo, and what does he do? He still doesn't teach Samuel to honor God, but Samuel still honors God because he just wants more of him. Later in, in, in the books of Samuel, there's, there's a guy carrying the Ark of the Covenant, and he touches it, and God strikes him dead just simply touches the thing. And it wasn't like it was God himself. It was just simply an, uh, uh, an image, a symbol. It was a symbol. That's all it was. And God killed him for touching it. But Samuel wasn't killed for sleeping in the room where he wasn't even allowed to be. And what I'm getting at is this. Samuel didn't know but he sought after God, and God gave mercy because he was seeking after him. The guy who touched the ark and was killed, he wasn't supposed to be carrying it like that. 
God told him, you carry it by its handles. He put it on, on a cart instead. He dishonored God, he did in front of all Israel. And then, as the cart was being pulled, the Ark of the Covenant slipped, and he tried to grab it with his hand. See, if he would have been honoring God in the first place, God wouldn't have struck him down. How do we know that? Because here's Samuel sleeping in the Holy of Holies where he's not even allowed to be, and God did not strike him down. That should tell us something about God's mercy. And that should also tell us something about the law. The law was created for man's benefit, not man for the law. Never forget that. The law was created for our benefit. We were not created to fulfill the law. Never forget that. If we weren't, when David broke the law with the showbread, he would have been killed. When Samuel broke the, broke the law with the Ark of the Covenant, he would have been killed. But God gave mercy because it wasn't all about the law. It wasn't all about the law. So that takes us to, to here we have you know, all this stuff happening. Now, now notice it says here that Eli's, Eli was, Eli's eyes were growing dim. He was going blind. Now why is that important to the story? Why did they put that in there? It has nothing to do with what's going on. Well, let's keep reading. That the Lord called Samuel and he said, here I am. And so we go through this whole routine. Um, then he, he ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But, but he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down again. The Lord called yet again. Samuel, so Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he answered, I did not call it, my son, lie down again. Have, have you ever had your toddler get out of bed? Get back in bed. Get back in bed. Daddy, daddy, you can get water tomorrow. There's not a water shortage. <laughs> Anyways, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor had the word of the Lord yet been revealed to him. He was seeking something he didn't even fully comprehend. We see the exact same thing happen in the book of Job, where Job diligently honors God, and he didn't even understand what he was doing. And then at the end of the book, he says this, I've heard, but now I see. And it's totally different than I thought it was. Never mind everything that I've said thus far. Just forget the whole thing. My bad. Because I didn't understand you. And I didn't understand me. So the Lord called Samuel again for the third time. And he rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli discerned that the Lord was calling the boy. About time, Eli. You're supposed to be the priest. Come on now. And Eli said to Samuel, go lie down and see, and, and it, I'm sorry, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down and get in his place. Now, this is the part that is important for understanding why it mentions Eli was blind. In verse 10, pay attention closely. Then the Lord came and stood and called at other times, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. Did you catch it? I'll say it again. Then the Lord called and came and stood and called as at other times Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel said, Speak for your servant is listening. Did you get that Did you catch it that time? God came and stood. God himself came down and stood in front of Samuel. And Eli didn't even know what the heck was going on because he was too blind to see it. Whereas here we have a kid, Samuel who's sleeping in the holy of holy place where he's not even supposed to be. And God calls him out from, from his almost asleep stupor to talk to him. And even when Samuel's too ignorant to know that God's talking to him, because he, he doesn't know what the heck's going on, God still speaks to him. Because it wasn't about Samuel's perfection. It was about God's goodness. See, when we want to hear from God, God doesn't meet us in the middle. As soon as we set our hearts to seeking after God, God runs to us. He doesn't meet us in the middle. He waits for us to take a fleeting glance towards him, and he overwhelms us with his goodness. He just overwhelms us with his goodness. Here's Samuel in the holy of holy place where he's not even supposed to be. This is a big no-no. Read the law. It's a big no-no. This is like take him out into the city and kill him kind of deal. And not only did he not tell Israel to kill him, he didn't kill him himself. Because Samuel was seeking after God. And for God, that was good enough. That was good enough. God didn't even care that Samuel was breaking the law. Because Samuel was seeking him. And that's all he wanted. That's all he wanted. The law wasn't created for us to follow. It was created 
for our benefit. So God came and stood and spoke. Which brings to a very interesting point. When Samuel was ready to, re uh, to receive from God, God put himself where Samuel would find him. What do I mean? Well, I mean, I know I kind of said it a little bit confusing, but it says that Eli told him, go and, st and, and, and lie back, and when God answers, do this. Samuel was in a place to listen to God. He was ready to encounter God. And so what did God do? He came and stood. Only the last time does it say that God came and stood. The other times, God didn't come and stand. Do you know why? Because Samuel wasn't ready to encounter God. After Eli told him, this is what you do, then he was ready to encounter God. And so then, and only then, God came and stood. God answers us according to where we are spiritually. If you're not there yet, God knows it, and he will encounter you where you are. God takes us wherever we are. He doesn't leave us wherever we are, but he takes us wherever we are. Wherever you are in your life, you turn to God, he hears you just like that. So what made the difference in chapter 3, verse 1? Now the voice uh, and, and word from the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were infrequent. The difference was the heart. Samuel sought God. And he sought him with his whole heart. And second off, even though his authority had no idea what the heck was going on, Samuel submitted to authority. Because submitting to authority is submitting to God. By honoring those human people over you, you are honoring God. And you might say, well, Eli was wrong. Yeah, yeah, he was wrong. He was totally wrong. I'm not sick enough for Eli at all. But Samuel did what was right, even though everybody else wasn't doing what was right. And God rewarded him by being the only person in all of Israel that, he, that God came and stood and spoke. The only other time that God did this and like this before this time was when he was giving the law to Moses. 400 years before. That's saying something. That is saying something. And so the result of all of this, chapter 3, verse 11, the Lord said to Samuel, that was the result, that the Lord spoke. In a time when, when God wasn't speaking, God spoke. In a time when visions were infrequent, Samuel saw God. He didn't see a vision of God. He saw God. In a time when the priest, the spiritual leadership themselves, were blind, Samuel saw him. And the difference being that Samuel sought God, and Samuel did the right thing. He sought God, and he did it right. You, you, sometimes we, we have this idea that if someone else does something stupid, that gives us an excuse. You go ahead and do whatever you want, but you're not going to hear from God. We don't come to God on our terms. God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to keep cheating on my wife. I'm going to keep looking at pornography. I'm going to just keep doing drugs and living my life however the heck I want to. And you're going to answer me. No, he's not. No, he's not. So... In closing, I had something else there, but Ben told me, you know, you know, your dad really likes in closing. So I said, okay, all right. And I literally rewrote it on the PowerPoint and on my sheet. In closing, not in conclusion, not last words or final thoughts, none of that. In closing, in closing. If you guys are taking notes, make sure you put that down on your paper and circle it a couple times. In closing. Jesus said this. He said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst because they will be filled. And you know something that's interesting? Proverbs says that gossip is like a tasty morsel. The Bible itself compares eating gossip with, eating spirit, uh, with being spiritually hungry. You can either get your fill from gossip and slander and strife. 
or you can get your fill from seeking after God. They're both going to fill you, but one is going to be good and one is going to be not good. So blessed are those who hunger, for they will be filled. So I want to encourage you, put away all strife. What I mean by that is, let's give some examples. Marital conflict. Stop thinking that you're the one who's right all the time. Stop not listening to your spouse. Stop always having to have the last word in. And I'm talking to men and women, men and women, not, not, not just the men, not just the women. Really, get along with each other. When, when we realize that our spouses were given to us as a blessing, not a curse, it changes how we should treat them. And uh, then another example, political conflict. Oh boy. I, I know it seems like this nation is split into resist the urge to take a side between the two. Please do. Please do. You don't have to be a Republican. You don't have to be a Democrat. But please leave politics out of it. Because here's the thing. People don't need to know you as a Republican or as a Democrat. They need to know you as a servant of God. And when we post stuff on social media like Facebook or Twitter, is it glorifying to God or is it going on political rants? When we talk to people, are we talking about them, those stupid Republicans or those stupid Democrats or those stupid libertarians? Or, or are we talking to people about God? I'll move on. Another example. Gossip. Gossip is another, t another type of strife. Remember that if people are willing to listen to you talk about people, they are willing to talk about you to other people. <laughs> Slander, that's where you talk about somebody. You know, this isn't just something that all the old people are doing. This is something that the kids do too. You know, are, 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 you put a whole bunch of kids in classes together and then stick them there for all, all day, five days a week. Surprise, surprise, they learn a few bad habits like gossiping. Who would have thunk it? <laughs> but anyways... Um, so put away those kinds of things because if you're, if you're actively involved in those kinds of things, you're not going to hear from God. You're not going to have victories. You're not going to be able to seek God because you're already seeking putting down other people. And here's the thing that I had to learn a very, very difficult lesson. God made them special just like he made you special. And when you attack one of God's creations, you're attacking God. Have you ever done something that your, your magnum opus, the thing that you're so proud of in your whole life, the one thing that you think was the best thing, if your whole life could be, could be reduced down to one single thing that was your best thing you ever did, and somebody criticized it, would that hurt your feelings or would it make you feel good? Well, it probably hurt your feelings. Now imagine God, the God of the entire universe who said, I created that person because I thought they needed to live. Out of all the things that I created in the earth, I thought they were. I thought my entire creation was missing that person. And so then you take it and you talk against that person. You know, there have been a few politicians that I have not been very crazy about. And I think that if I were to do a poll, there's a lot of here that have some politicians that they're not too crazy about. But did you know that God made them too? Did, did you know that? God made them too. We think that's different because, hey, it's okay to gossip about the pastor because he's a pastor. Or it's okay to, to gossip about the mayor or the governor because they're, they're not really people, they're a position. Or the president because, well, he's not really a person either. Well, no, no. You will either seek after God or you will seek after the things of the world. So if you seek God and live his way, he will put himself in a position for you to find him and he will speak and it won't be by your goodness. So just a few last things. First off, pray, read your Bible, come to church. Those are good things, okay? Do those things. Do those good Christian things. But honor God. Because doing a thing does nothing. Doing a thing so as to honor God, that's different. You can read your Bible every single day and go to hell. It's not going to matter. But if you honor God and as a result read your Bible, that's different. That's different. We aren't saved by our works, but after we're saved, we should probably have some works. Amen. See the difference there? It's not our goodness. It's our seeking and our loving. So that's broken down into, into three, three parts. First off, not our goodness. 
God's the one who spoke to Samuel. It wasn't because Samuel was good, it was because, or even as we saw, because Samuel was doing what he was supposed to. Samuel wasn't doing what he was supposed to, but God still came and spoke to him. So it wasn't because of our goodness, right? We're all together on this. God answers us not according to our goodness, but just because he's good. The next point there, but our seeking. Are you hungry for God? Well, what does that mean? Then you probably aren't hungry for him. <laughs> Are you seeking after him? Or do you just want more of him? When, when you're listening to music, do you listen to music that, that honors God and that, that makes you think more of him and, and, of, and of loving people? Or do you listen to music that just goes on calling people bad names and making women as though they were just symbols? Kanye West, for instance, most of his music is, is very demeaning to people and God. So are we listening to that kind of crap? Or are we putting stuff in our ears that will actually benefit us? See what I mean? Are we seeking God with a heart? And then the third part of that, and are we loving people? What have you done the past week to love someone else? Remember, your whole life, if it's all about you, you're not loving people. Because love is shown by service. Love is shown by laying down yourself for someone else. If you love your spouse, you will think of them higher than yourself. If you love your spouse, you will sacrifice your best being for their best being. Does that kind of make sense? So I hope that all this has kind of made sense. If you want to hear from God, it's not rocket science. Seek him. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have it all together. Seek him. That's it. And he will answer you. Not according to your goodness, but according to his goodness. Never forget that. And this is my final, 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 final in closing. That Samuel was disobeying the law when God answered him. At the very time that Samuel was answered by God, he was in the process of breaking the law when God came and spoke to him. Never forget that. It is not by our goodness, but by seeking after God. By seeking after God. Randy, can you close up in prayer, please?